Hello, everyone. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to FHFA's inaugural Velocity Tech Sprint. My name is I Diallo. I'm a program manager at Alliance for Innovative Regulation. Just a few housekeeping items for our audience. Uh, please submit any questions or comments using the chat feature. And please keep in mind that this session will be recorded. Uh, today, our panel will focus on FinTech founders' perspectives, using experience to drive change. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our moderator, Amias, a partner from QED Investors. All right. Um, well, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who's uh, joining and listening. Um, by way of brief introduction, I think um, many of you may know this, but I spent eight years at the Treasury Department. So spent a lot of time with your colleagues at FHFA, mainly them yelling at me, um, but, uh, but some, some, some great times and uh, really pleased to be able to join with the Alliance for Innovation and Regulation um, to, to moderate this panel. Um, I'm gonna let each of the founders here introduce themselves, but I think just to start, this is a this is a pretty neat panel because all three of the companies, um, Prism, Nova, and Asusu, are doing different things to unlock really meaningful access um, and inclusion by really taking different approaches to data and analytics than what has traditionally been done in this country. And I think it's a it's an amazing way to start um, to really focus on the needs of consumers. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about mortgage today, um, but the issues around data access and how better and richer data leads to better inclusion and access to financial services, I think, are applicable across the whole landscape. Um, so I'm excited, and I hope you guys are excited uh, as well. And I'm going to start uh, assuming my screen looks like other people's, but I, I know that it's not actually the case. Um, I'm going to start with um, with you, Aaron, in in the top uh, of my screen. So Aaron Allard is uh, from Prism Data, and Aaron, why don't you talk a little bit about what you guys do, and uh, you can introduce yourself along the way. Sure. Thanks, Amias. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, I'm Aaron Allard, General Manager of Prism Data. A uh, brief personal history, um, spent most of my career in-house at banks, primarily financial institutions, working with fintechs and other companies to build um, innovative products and services to help consumers um, access the financial sector. I came in-house, sort of crossed the border into fintech a few years ago, uh, and now I'm at Prism Data. So Prism, um, we are essentially a platform that provides the infrastructure and analytics to let lenders use cash flow underwriting in an automated, scalable, and predictive way to uh, risk score consumers for anything from a credit card to looking at mortgage use case and everything in between. Um, we will categorize and structure the data, provide attributes and insights, and then risk scores, sort of off the shelf scores that lenders can plug into their models and, and use. So we spun out of a company called Petal, which is uh, traditionally used cash flow to underwrite consumers for fairly priced credit cards. Um, really excited for the conversation and I appreciate being here. Awesome. Um, next, we'll talk about Isuzu and Wemimo. I know this is, um, uh, you know, specifically looking at a totally new field of data. So why don't you give a little bit of your background and um, what Isuzu brings to the table? Absolutely. Um, thanks a lot, Amayas, and such a delight to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Wemimo Abe, and every time I had the good fortune to talk about Isuzu, I always like to go down memory lane to talk about the why. So I think it plays a quintessential role in terms of what we do. Um, for me, I grew up in the slums of Lagos, Nigeria. I was raised by my mother. I haven't lost my father and two very spirited sisters. And one thing my mother fundamentally believed in was just the importance of education. Uh, she afforded my school fees to one of the finest high schools in the land. And that's what led me to this magical place called America. Uh, we immigrated from 80 degree weather in Lagos to negative 22 degrees in Minnesota which was a character building experience. And during that transition, something important happened. Uh, my mother and I did not have a credit score. We walked into one of the biggest financial institutions in Minneapolis to borrow money. And we were turned away and had to go borrow money from a payday loan lender at over 400% interest rate. My mother sold my father's wedding ring. We borrowed money from church members and that's how we got started in the United States. So really inspired by that experience and my co-founder, Samir, we started a susu on three core premises. No matter where you come from, 
the color of your skin and particularly your financial identity shouldn't determine where you end up in the wealthiest nation the world has ever seen. And what we do at ASUS is really simple. When you pay your rent, we make sure that rental data is captured and reported into the consumer rating agencies. Why is this important? Um, we have roughly um, it. 35% of Americans will rent on an average is send over $1.44 trillion to their landlords um, every year. And for renters, rent is usually the largest monthly expense. So it made sense for us that when you pay your mortgage, that data reflects on your credit score. When you pay your rent, let's give credit where credit is due. And when folks don't can afford to pay rent, we, order, we also pay them up with other financial products. So as a society, we're not solving homelessness backwards. So ISUSU is available um, through our owners and operators in over 4 million rental units in all 50 states in the union. And we're just really excited about the impacts we're having in the lives of many. Awesome. And, and Misha, I think uh, Nova Credit similarly really focused on the the problems of underserved, um, in particular, immigrants. So why don't you share a little bit about your story and, and the Nova Credit story? So there we go. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, very, very similar to what, uh, what, what Mimo's story was or, and is, you know, millions of people um, move to the U.S. every year. Um, multiples of that move, move around the world. And when, when someone first uh, arrives in the U.S., uh, you know, you arrive invisible. There's no credit bureau data. There's no bank data. There's no rental data. There's no data on who you are. You are you are absolutely invisible. And so you spend the next uh, few quarters, if not years, trying to build a representative credit profile. Uh, and there's a variety of tools and, and, and solutions out there to help you do that. Uh, what we what we do is we identified that problem, and, and the way that we we solve it is we've um, built the ability for people to arrive with their credit history that they built about themselves in their home country. And so you can think about us a little bit like a cross-border credit bureau, at least the, the, the core business is that. And so, you know, if someone moves to the U.S. from Lagos or London or Toronto or Delhi, we can pull their data from wherever they're from, bring it here, standardize it into one report format that we call the credit passport, and we can deliver that into uh, our partners. So we work with American Express, HSBC, Verizon, a number of other uh, players in the financial services sector. That's really where we started the business. And then from there, we've uh, created a range of other products and services like cash flow underwriting, verifying income using bank data, and a variety of other capabilities. Awesome. So just to kick us off, I know that um, you know mortgage is only a small part of, of where you guys play today. But when you look at the mortgage market, um, and I'm gonna sort of don't don't answer like the the answer I don't want is the biggest problem is exactly what my company solves. <laughs> so, so reach outside of your own company. But when you guys look at the mortgage market, um, you know what do you think is the biggest problem for for consumers? What makes this market interesting uh, interesting to you in terms of a really um, you know, a, a consumer surplus that, that could be created if we, if we tackled it. So, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe I can see you, you, uh, nodding. Do you want to jump in first? Yeah, happy to, happy to jump in here. You know, when we look at the, the landscape, particularly as it relates to mortgage, you know, where I would focus my attention on is particularly low to medium income folks and folks that don't have a financial identity. I think precisely what Misha talked about. You know, when we look at the data, we have 45 million people in this country um, that are either credit invisible or have no credit scores. The average debt in America is roughly, you know, $94,000. If you do that math, if we can unlock additional capital, you know, for folks um, in the marketplace, we can unlock, you know, north of $4 trillion. And that's not only good for the American economy. I think, you know, this is a classic example of the rising, you know, tide raise all boats. So from my vantage points, you know, financial access is crucial and there are steps towards getting um, financial access. So when you think about the mortgage markets um, as, it, as, as it is today, obviously we see, you know, acceleration um, from, from a rates perspective, consecutive increase um, in rates um, by the Fed, obviously to quell um, inflation. And then we also see challenges with things like down payments, where low to medium income households are struggling 
for that down payment to get access to you know that quintessential American dream. And the third thing is underwriting, being able to price risk appropriately, which is what Aaron is working tirelessly on. So, you know, to your point, we're not going to dwell on particularly what we do, but I think it's going to take a collective effort to actually address some of the challenge and create more access. It takes what Misha is doing when new immigrants um, come into this country or, you know, just new workers from anywhere. Uh, they need to be able to establish a financial identity. And then there's a continuation in terms of what a company like Isuzu does that when they are renting, that data can be captured. And then there's a collaboration in terms of what Aaron does to make sure that we can better price and get holistic data, especially from a cash flow perspective. And it's been encouraging to see what institutions like FHFA has done, working alongside the GSEs, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, to use alternative data to better price risk and get everyday Americans um, the opportunity to get into this financial prosperity journey um, of getting to home. So in a nutshell, it's not one thing um, that would unlock the access. You know, at Isusu, the core meaning of what we do is if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you fundamentally need to go together. So it's going to take what Misha is doing. It's going to take what Aaron is doing. And it's going to take what FHFA is doing from an innovation standpoint. And then the GSEs and lenders to help us create um, a panacea of opportunities and create more mortgages for folks that have been traditionally left behind. Yeah, Misha, when you think about this, I'd be curious how, um, you know, you guys have particularly focused on the immigrant experience and this cross-border credit bureau as the, as the core business before you've expanded into other products as well. Um, you know, what is, what is the mortgage market look like for for immigrants to this country, um, what are some of the core problems in that? How big is that um, relative to to the mortgage market as a as a whole? Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe like the the, the overarching point to to build on what's already been been said is that you know not all underserved segments are created equal, right? Like different segments have different pain points and challenges, and there are different uh, data solutions that can best serve them. So for, you know, for, for the immigrant segment, we think we have, you know, one of, if not the best solution for other underserved uh, segments that may have a bank account, there's a range of data solutions. Uh, so like there's a, there's almost like a segment driven strategy within this broader bucket of 45 or 60 million underserved that has been, has been quoted. Um, and, you know, as, as we think about like the financial system and, and the credit bureau system, I think you know, a lot of people like to hate on the hate on the credit bureaus, but but you know, at a systemic level, they they do create an incredible amount of of, of good, but they lack on ramps for for people who are are new to it, right? So if you arrive in the U.S., you arrive invisible. If you're not a regular user of credit, you're a new user of credit. You get stuck in this sort of this catch twenty two, and a lot's been written about how you need to have credit history to be able to access credit, and only when you have started to access credit can you start building credit history and breaking through that catch twenty two is is really hard and that and that is really where you know companies like all of ours here and 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 many others are helping create on ramps for for people who are new to the credit system because if you don't have a pre-existing credit file, it's virtually impossible to get a mortgage. It's really hard to get to get a mortgage. And so coming back to this like uh, segment level view, at least within people who are new to country, um, you know, about to put some numbers into perspective, the U.S. Uh, is going to grow its population by about 50 million people uh, in the next 20 to 30 years. And uh, that's a big number, 50 million. Um, 100 percent of that population growth, immigration, right? It's the only source of population growth in this country because our natural born population is in demographic decline, which is the case of every developed economy around around the world at, at this point. Uh, and so every single one of those individuals gets stuck in the same catch-22 of needing to reestablish and build their financial health and financial life and reestablish all their accounts. Um, and so with respect to getting mortgage, new arrived people who recently arrived or, or newcomers, which is how to, how we refer to this segment, uh, can't really get mortgages. Like there's there are a few players who do you know uh, non-resident mortgages, which isn't really the same as mortgages for people who have arrived. Uh, but it really is is one of these industry problems that's been um, very difficult to crack historically because of a lack of data. Um, and so, you know, you you have to resort to 
these like you know, non-traditional mortgage lenders, uh, you obviously pay higher rates, higher um, higher down payments, and it's just it's not the same uh, opportunity and the same experience. Yeah, I mean, Aaron, in, in particular, I think one of the things that Misha's observations strike is that this idea that um, when you don't have good data visibility, you end up with higher cost. And um, I'd be curious, I think, you know, one kind of cold, cynical thing would be, well, you know, higher risk, higher cost, right? It's that simple. But obviously at PRISM, one of the things that, that you guys are working on is saying, well, actually, you know, if we get this right, you know, we can price the risk more accurately and therefore bring down the cost. Um, so I'd love to hear how much of this can come out you know, if we had all this data can come out in better pricing um, and how much of this is just a, you know, hey, this is a, you know, these are lower income population groups, therefore it's higher risk, therefore it's going to be more costly, right? That's sort of the cynical view that I think you'd hear a lot of people say, but, um, but what, what's, your, what's your view on this, Aaron? How much can new data sources and new approaches to underwriting and risk cut through some of that and really demonstrate that, um, you know, people without traditional credit files are nonetheless uh, capable of handling, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the ability to repay um, and, and, the, and the ability to sort of take on this, this uh, financial obligation. Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, first of all, you know, if we really want to think about the problem from the consumer's perspective, we have to remember this is probably the most emotionally fraught transaction that many of these consumers will ever undertake, or at least if it's the first time or the second time, there's a lot of emotion in any issue in the process, whether it's the amount of time or kind of confusion on how to get a mortgage, who providers are, how everything works is just exacerbated by the fact that, you know, for some folks, even people who to um, your point, Amias, maybe sort of thin file or no file purely from a credit score perspective, have diligently paid their rent on time for years, have saved money. They may use debit cards instead of credit cards. They are, you know, gainfully employed. It's still kind of terrifying. There's still a sense of, you know, do I actually belong here? Am I, am I going to qualify? Is this going to work? And so I think, you know, in particular, when we think about such a um, complex structure, which is the mortgage industry. I think, Wamima, what you said is correct. Partnerships are key. We're, none of us are going to solve the whole thing. But I think working together with uh, private companies, with regulators, with financial institutions who are interested in um, you know, taking a fresh look or looking at things a little bit differently, we can actually accomplish um, some change. And what we've seen you know, in our experience, just to share a little bit, is there actually is a meaningful way to look at consumers who don't have a credit score, who have a thin file, who go on to pay you back in the same way as prime borrowers. So, you know, they uh, have those signals. And oftentimes we see them in the bank account data of um, getting a paycheck, of saving every month, of um, paying their rent, of paying other types of loans that you may not see or that may not go into a traditional credit score. I think what Misha said is absolutely correct. There are there's real value in the traditional credit scores. There's just more that we can do, not just from PRISM standpoint, but more that we can all do to look at um, how to help consumers both be priced upon, based upon their risk of repayment or their likelihood to repay and to get through the whole process more efficiently um, and with more transparency. So, you know, one of the, the, if we zoom out from the specific dialogue around data and financial inclusion, um, you guys are also on the forefront of a huge number of partnerships with, you know, either traditional lenders who are trying to, um, you know, serve uh, populations that have traditionally been excluded, new lenders um, who are trying, you know, obviously, Aaron, you, you spun out of one of these. Um, so um, one of the things I'd, I'd love to have you guys talk a little bit, and Aaron, we'll start with you this time, but um, what is possible in terms of moving the needle on the cost to underwrite and the speed to underwrite. Maybe you could share some of the pedal experience as an example of what pedal was able to do relative to incumbent lenders, um, even just on like efficiency metrics, leaving aside inclusion. So 
Um, what have you seen in terms of what um, new lenders and new technology and old lenders is able to do in terms of just increasing the efficiency and, and bringing tech to bear here? Sure. So, I mean, if you think about it, bare bones, cash flow underwriting has existed for a very, very long time. It's just not been that efficient to put into practice. And then, you know, if you think about, um, say, a traditional lender using cash flow, they may have a lot of experience with their own systems, with their own, um, you know, way of looking at data, a way that data is structured from a file format. And so, you know, it might be possible to um, build something for one set of consumers with one set of uh, data structure. What we've seen um, on the pedal side and now at Prism as we've expanded is when you build the infrastructure first, the capability of where we are, where we can accept deposit account data from any platform, aggregator, bank, et cetera, um, and spend a lot of time. It took us a couple of years early on at looking at how to structure it, how to categorize it, how to be really, really accurate, and then build enrichment and then build scores and things on top of that. When you arrive at a place where you have enough experience and you've sort of have belief or have faith in your analytics, you can deploy it in a very fast way. So you think about looking at a consumer, we can score, you know, if we ingest the bank account transactions for, let's say, six months, in about a second, we can spit back out to a lender, um, you know, what their cash score would be, what their rent payments are, what their income looks like. And I'm sure, you know, for my other colleagues here on the panel, it's similar. So you can really, really reduce from perhaps hours of um, an underwriter looking at and reviewing loan files and things like that to seconds for certain pieces of it that go into a picture that may take hours instead of um, much, much longer. And just to, to connect that concept to, you know, the mortgage industry, obviously people at FHFA will um, remember the, the creation of FHFA, will remember the, the history of the financial crisis and two of the most important reforms that came out of the financial crisis with respect to this were the ability to the focus on ability to repay and the focus on debt to income. And Aaron, maybe just to, to take a double click there, like what you've just described really does get at exactly those issues, which were not in the traditional underwriting process, right? Because those are not FICO questions, those are cash flow questions. Um, so when you guys have done this, are you like really directly answering those debt to income uh, questions and the ability to repay questions? Is it, is it that direct that, that you can do that now in a second instead of, you know, hours of manual checking? We can, we can answer um, very directly what the income is that we see versus the debt that we're seeing in the bank account. We won't always see at a granular level every aspect of debt, right? So we can extrapolate based upon credit card payments and things like that. But we will answer um, with income what the net is that we see um, but based on sources. So W-2, um, gig, things like that, we're sort of taking into account broader than just you know, what is my W-2 biweekly income? And then we'll give out to our lenders, we'll provide back um, at a pretty granular level, the type of uh, debt that we're seeing, the frequency, the amount, and then compare, you know, month over month, last six months, last three months to give a variety of factors back. Um, and so, you know, I think the more that we work in particularly with lenders in the mortgage market and understand exactly what metrics they're looking for, it's not just a prism capability, it's a capability of folks who are looking at the data to answer those questions in a pretty um, uh, quick format. Yeah, and, and Misha, if you, if you think about this, um, again, zooming out a bit to the what's possible, right? I mean, you, you use this great stat of like, the population growth for the United States is going to come from immigrants. It's going to come from thin file, right? Um, so when you think, you know, maybe it's five years now forward, 10 years forward, like what do you think the mortgage industry should look like, the mortgage underwriting process should look like that it doesn't look like today? The story I often com come back to is like, let, let's, let's remember a world for like how underwriting and credit decisions uh, got done 50 years ago before FICO existed. And the, and the way that worked is like, you'd show up at a bank in person and you'd show up with your papers that prove your employment, that prove your, uh, you know, your income, that prove your cash balance. Maybe you've got a bank statement that you managed to print out. And as 
you know, the world has gotten more and more automated and our various fair lending laws got put into place. Everything has kind of moved away from that and gone to, uh, you know, bureau-based uh, bureau based underwriting. And I think there's, there's a lot of um, good from an inclusion perspective and bias removal perspective that comes from a lot of this automation, but it has made it very difficult to use alternative data. And we can unpack that in, in, in more depth if, if we'd all like to. But I, I think the the world, coming back to your question, five, 10 plus years from now, will use all of the financial health information that is out there. Like there's, you know, core to what we, our outlook for the world and in, in building a credit bureau for the 21st century is that there, you know, credit bureaus will not look like one big monolithic database that has all the financial health information under the sun. It will look like infrastructure that can tap into bureau data, bank data, global bureau data, rental payment data, various other forms of information that really help paint a more complete picture of who consumers are, particularly consumers who are more underserved. And there is a range of solutions out there uh, that can make use of that data more automated, uh, a lot easier to use. Um, so, I, you know, as as an example, we launched a partnership about two and a half years ago with uh, with SoFi, uh, which is one I can I can speak a little publicly about. Where they use us to verify and fully automate the income of their applicants using their bank data, right? So they they come to us, uh, we look at an individual's bank history, and we can fully automate the verification of income process, and therefore approve people who are immigrants or non-immigrants. Really, doesn't matter. Anyone who has a bank account, and that has been able to dramatically improve the efficiency, the speed, the cost to service uh, of that of that loan process. And so, there's a lot of opportunities like that, um, certainly within the mortgage space and, and and more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea that you know if this we had a very rich process but it was a manual process and it was frankly just rife with opportunities for bias right um and in our efforts both sort of industrially to increase automation and policy wise to decrease bias we ended up just really compressing the amount of data that we were willing to look at and so I love the idea, as you just laid out, Misha, of a vision where we um, take all the benefit from a policy perspective of suppressing bias but bring and automation, but bring back the richness. Um, Remo, tell, me, tell us a little bit about your journey, particularly about making alternative data. And you have a very, uh, at one level, super straightforward, but also, um, you know, quite different source of data that you're bringing and trying to create pipes into the financial system for. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what the journey has been like to explain the why and, you know, what were some of the frictions that you saw um, in trying to bring this very rich new data source to bear in the more traditional financial system? Yeah, thanks a lot, Amayas. You know, I think when we when we look at rental data, um, it's a very, very fragmented space. Um, like Misha rightfully alluded to, the consumer rating agencies are doing their possible best to collect accurate information to better price risk. And we had to work tirelessly, we're talking about years, um, to get them comfortable and collecting credible rental data to include in their models. And the status quo before was if a renter wanted to report their, you know, rent information into a consumer rating agency, they were self-reporting, which is not necessarily reliable. Um, so what we built essentially is a pipe where we became the furnisher on, on record or the data um, attester um, where we can work with owners and operators of real estate, where the payments data is coming from them, pull that data, verify it and make sure it's correct before it's reported into the consumer rating agencies. And to amplify that effort and scale it, we also had some help, particularly um, from institutions like FHFA and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And what that has led to is, you know, through the equitable housing um, plan, where FHFA essentially said, how do we capture on-time rental data so that data is reflected and we give credit where credit is due? 
And through multiple collaborations with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, because they control a lot of liquidity in the secondary market, being able to encourage their borrowers and lenders to encourage the adoption of rent reporting at scale. So before we got into this space, less than 10% of rental data um, was reported into the consumer rating agency. So that's less than 10% of roughly $1.44 trillion annually um, of rental data. And now I think we're making a lot of progress and you know we're, we're inching towards 15 to 20% in just less than two and a half years. So that's the power of collaboration that we've seen. And that's the power of exploring the road less traveled. There's this rhetoric out there in terms of working with government institutions or government sponsored entities and how things can be slow. Um, but I have been very encouraged by the pace of innovation um, and the willingness to actually you know, consider some of these facets. And the results we've seen, particularly from an ISUSU perspective is we've been able to establish credit scores now for folks that never had a credit score for over 50,000 people um, on our platform. And one thing that we've also seen, we just did a report out with Freddie Mac. Now that has also generated additional financing activities in folks that will otherwise be left behind. So folks that were subprime before um, have gone on to essentially get additional credits activities on their financial profile. That's now last report we put out with Freddie Mac was roughly $2.5 billion I mean, financing activities in just under two years. Um, and I think over a billion dollars of that was mortgages and close second was auto loans. So that's what we've seen the power of alternative data, particularly um, as done and rent in this case. It's really an approach that takes a village, the willingness of the consumer rating agencies to you know, come up with a really um, thorough process so the information is accurate and reliable. The willingness of institutions like FHFA saying, look, yes, there are horrors of the past of what has happened where you know, people of color um, were left behind in the wealth building journey. And how can we you know, level the playing field and encouraging the likes of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and lenders and borrowers um, to get on the program by subsidizing the cost of what we do um, has really been encouraging to see. And the outcomes are there. This is just not rhetoric. You know, we've been able to establish credit scores and see people go on to become homeowners, car owners, and even get access to quality financial products, um, even yeah. things like the credit card. So really encouraging. What was, the, what was right. the process like? I mean, what were some of the, um, give a little more color on some of the objections or some of the initial friction points. What were the hurdles that you had to get over in, in, in the beginning parts of this journey? What were the questions people were asking? Um, uh, yeah. And how did you sur surmount them? Yeah, look, I think in the first place, from a consumer perspective, consumers were actually shocked. Renters were shocked that this data was not factored into um, the credit rating agents. So I think we live in a society where, you know, we treat people like they are guilty until proven innocent. You have to go into debt to show that you're credit worthy. You know, that's like solving a challenge backwards. Um, so we had to essentially deal with that inertia. And then there are practical challenges. You know, you have to be, you have to get certification like SOC 2 type 2, which is usually reserved for publicly traded companies to be able to get access to personal identifiable data, our customers, which is the owners and operators to trust us that we can furnish this data. You also have to go through exams, sometimes six hour plus, which each consumer rating agencies, so they understand your processes, uh, so we're regulated in a nutshell, like a bank, um, you know, in terms of the data that we capture. And then above all, working with FHFA and Freddie Mac um, through our collaboration is, are we going to cost any arm to the consumer, right? Are, are you, what are some of the unintended um, sort of ramifications of what we're doing? And those are some of the things we focused on, um, but that took 24 months, you know, 36 months of diligence and conversations to go through. But, you know, our approach at ASUSU is there's an African-American saying, if you hang around the barbershop, sooner or later, you're going to get a haircut. And, you know, the collaboration, that's what it's all about. We just hung around and continue to knock on the door and got to be patient. Yeah. Um, I've been I, really I love it. So, um, 
you know, a lot of the people who are listening here are, are in the FHFA. They have the ability to influence rules, to, to participate in them. Um, uh, Aaron and, and Misha, have you seen an area where either a regulation or a regulatory expectation prevented you from doing something that you thought would help consumers or, or you know, where, where that friction wasn't something so simple as, well, how do I trust this data? Or I need a little more time to think about it, but where people could point to something specific about, well, I'm not sure how the FHFA would think about this, or this rule says that I've got to use, you know, data like this and your data doesn't match or something like that. Have you, have you guys seen concrete examples where um, regulation or regulatory expectations are creating a friction? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's not just FHFA, but I think across the board, when we talk to um, fina regulated financial institutions, I don't know that it's necessarily, you know, rule X or, you know, specific um, item Y is, is problematic. But I, I do think um, there can be a sense of concern about how a pilot or how things might be perceived. Um, and we've seen on one hand, I think that improving, we have a lot of FIs that have, uh, come out with, uh, pilots of things that they're doing, they're new and different, and we have, um, partnerships and things like that. But I think there still is some concern in some conversations where either we're having, or if I talk to folks, um, that I used to work with at, at banks and things like that, where there's just a little bit of uncertainty of, we think this is probably okay, but we're not completely sure what scrutiny would be placed upon us or what the conversations would need to happen ahead of time or things like that. And so I think the more sort of from a industry-wide partnership perspective, we can clarify and talk about what is in bounds and, and what types of activities would be permissible to explore. I think that opens up a few doors and maybe clears a little bit of uh, a little bit of smoke that that still sort of remains around the supervisory relationships and the conversations that we've had. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are some, you know, to to give credit here to a, a really great piece of work that um, AR did a couple of years ago when they looked out and they said they did a survey and they said what what is actually preventing innovation and regulation? What is actually preventing innovation in regulatory spaces? And they did a bunch of interviews. And one of the most interesting things for me is that the results came back and they were things like the Administrative Procedures Act, right? They were the, the cultural backdrop of, well, how much flexibility do I as a line examiner have to say, yes, how do I avoid being the person, you know, let's say an experiment doesn't work. Does that come back on me? How do I avoid saying, well, I approve the experiment if something bad could go ha uh, could happen? So I do think that there is, um, as you say, Aaron, there's a lot of cultural lock-in and that sometimes gets lost in the joints between a regulator who says, or an examiner who says, well, yeah, I might be interested, but I also you know, a lot of time these innovation guys come in with stupid ideas or you know, <laughs> crazy approaches who aren't actually that thoughtful. They aren't actually that careful. So you have this interplay between, you know, again, whether it's the quote unquote innovation uh, that was piped before the financial crisis or the innovation that, you know, opened the door for so many crypto scams. I think in the regulatory apparatus, there's often a, 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 a cultural expectation, which is like, gosh, last time I heard innovation, it was Sam Bankman Freed. Um, and, and so I think you're, you're making this point, which is that there's a ton of room for us all to do work. And I think events like this one are really a good example of saying, well, this is what, you know, and people love this phrase, but this is what responsible innovation actually looks like. Um, have you seen um, opportunities, and maybe Misha Turk, take it to you, um, right? There's probably a lot of discomfort in traditional financial institutions of even just doing KYC, let alone credit scoring on immigrants, people who don't have a social security number. How do I actually underwrite them? My system asks for a, you know, a social security number. Now you're telling me you know, something else. Um, so, and then also by definition in banking, you know, if you're banking non-Americans, you're typically 
banking high-risk individuals, and that can create increased scrutiny. So Misha, I'd love to hear you, whether it's specific to mortgage or more generally about this experience of navigating through these cultural expectations, even if they create unintended friction um, to innovation and inclusion. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to make sure I got myself off you know, to try to tackle that question. Um, I mean, I, th I think like the, the great irony here is, is that although, and this may be a slightly controversial thought in, in point, but I'll, I'll go there anyway. Although our fair lending and fair credit reporting acts uh, uh, laws were designed to create fairer access, they uh, have room for improvement in actually doing so. Um, and to be a little bit more more precise with respect to 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 underwriting is that you know it, it's pretty like uncontested at this point that more data can result in better decisions and more data can result in more access right and but the 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 piece that's that's hard is how can you prove that more data um, doesn't um, trip a wire on you know a various protected class definitions or how do you how do you ensure that you're not inadvertently discriminating against uh, particular uh, particular segments and so um one of the great great challenges of adopting alternative data whether it's rental data or cash flow data or global bureau data is getting financial institutions whether it be banks or mortgages comfortable uh with uh uh using alternative data that they haven't used before in an environment where they're under a lot of regulatory scrutiny. And, and that is a very uh, difficult problem from a data, data perspective. There's a chicken and egg in that problem and getting people able to use this data and proving that it's not discriminating before they actually have proof points of it doing so. Um, and so like that, that's one of like the, the central challenges with being able to actually drive more inclusion and helping those 45, 50 million underserved segments into the financial system with alternative data when financial institutions are scared of actually using this data that may be interpreted by a regulator as actually creating uh, less access. Um, and so, you know, that, that's just kind of one conceptual point. Coming back to your other, other question around financial access for, 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 for immigrants, yeah, I mean, the, the KYC challenge is a real one. Um, it takes weeks, if not months, to get an SSN. Uh, SSNs or ITINs are typically uh, mandatory fields to be able to complete a, a, a loan application, whether that be a mortgage or a card application. Uh, and, and yet you are most in need of those products day one, right? When you, when you first arrive. And so modernizing your onboarding experience, your application experience, your KYC processes, your credit approval processes to be able to handle consumers who haven't yet received their SSN is something that the whole industry needs to go through uh, in the coming quarters to be able to, you know, accept the only source of population growth uh, in in this country. And so there's a variety of tools and strategies and solutions out there that that do precisely that. Um, but I think to date, most mortgages, it is a hard requirement to have an SSN. And if you don't yet have one, you can't even complete the application. All right. So um, I know Wamimo is in Israel, and and uh, sounds like there may be some. <laughs> Some uh, logistical difficulties, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close uh, with a final question to you, and then we'll we'll keep uh, Aaron and Misha on for a little bit longer. Um, but uh, so this is a tech sprint. FHFA is you know sort of invited a bunch of people to work on solutions. So um, as they get into that, uh, we, what's the one piece of advice, or what's the one thing that you'd uh, ask them all to to put front and center? as they, they go into this uh, little bit of a problem-solving exercise and, and collaboration exercise over the next three days? I think one thing I would definitely encourage um, FHFA to do is, number one, it's been encouraging to see all the innovations that you know has happened um, over the years, and we've been strong collaborators alongside the GSC. So kudos, number one. I think we always jump into what, we could do better, um, but kudos on the thing, on the progress thus far, especially on um, leveraging alternative data to better price risk. Um, I think institutions like Vantage Scores have really benefited. I think they 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 published a report two weeks ago showing their 19 billion 
additional vantage scores pulled um, just because FHFA and the, the government sponsored entities can now leverage that and to better price things like mortgages. So there, there's been a lot of progress and things like rent reporting initiative and, and others. And I think on a go forward basis, one thing that will be helpful, and this speaks particularly what Misha talked about, there are a lot of um, legislation out there, and we speak to regulators every time, um, that add good intentions, um, and the letter of the law does not necessarily reflect the spirit um, of what is supposed to happen. I think FHFA can play a key role or work with different agencies um, to create a sandbox for us to actually explore um, different ideas um, that could have material impact um, in the lives of, you know, Americans. You know, one that comes to mind is, you know, there's a lot of things, particularly with the Privacy Act, um, that we need to rethink um, that might actually be um, keeping low to medium income folks behind. Um, Misha talks about the fact that, you know, SSNs, what happens with those that have ITINs, right? So we need to start thinking about, um, you know, different rules we have in place that are having unintended consequences and a need for a sandbox for startups to engage and create win, win, win outcomes. And I think that would be a key role that FHFA can play as a convener from an innovation perspective and work with different agencies um, to make that happen. Because ultimately, what we are all trying to do uh, is create more opportunities, but in a thoughtful way. Um, but creating those sandbox and those initiatives um, and leveraging other agencies they work with um, will be incredibly powerful um, to essentially create more access um, for everyday Americans. So, you know, kudos on all the progress thus far on, you know, things that have been done, but I think there's a lot more work that can be done, particularly on creating sandbox um, for startups, you know, like Misha's, like Aaron's and, and, and Isusu um, to engage and really show how we can have, you know, outsized impacts on the lives of everyday Americans. Excellent. Well, Umimo, thank you very much. We're going to keep Aaron and Misha here, but uh, really appreciate your time. Um, so I want to stick on this um, topic that we just did. Um, Misha, maybe you first. Uh, you know, if you were the head of the FHFA tomorrow, and also um, I magically repealed the Administrative Procedure Act, so just whatever you wanted to do, you could change one thing. Um, what would be what would be the one rule that you would write to help bring faster innovation? Always ask why. I think it, it's it's as a you know as as a business that partners with some of the most regulated institutions in in the world, right? We we support American Express, HSBC, Verizon, you know, a number of other top ten U.S. financial institutions. Um, the number of times that you know, a process or an opportunity gets derailed because someone that doesn't have full context on something says no or says some objection, and then everything just gets stalled. Um, I think as as you're looking inward, as you're looking at, you know, potentially partnering with your own innovation initiatives, partnering with other institutions like ourselves or others on innovation, you're going to run into a lot of no's. You're going to run into a lot of reasons for why something is hard or unclear or, um, or you know, risky um, and in, in most cases, those, I'll put, I'll frame them as objections, aren't new, right? These are things that every institution, every financial institution who wants to adopt innovation has already run into and has found its own path for how to get comfortable with a given risk, how to, how to, how to box it, how to measure it, how to A-B test into it, how to get greater clarity and I think, you know, as the folks listening, just bringing that mindset of, as you run into these hurdles, these obstacles internally, ask why, right? There's no like rocket science in consumer lending, like everything follows, you know, logic. And if a logical leap is being made without a clear explanation, like that's something that everyone should be able to, to understand. And I think particularly in highly regulated industries, like I've heard, you know, uh, I'll give you an example that I think colors colors the point a little bit. 
like uh, sending adverse action notices, uh, which is something that, you know, anytime you change a policy, you want to adopt a new piece of data. If you're going to reject somebody on the basis of that data, it may change, you know, this adverse action letter. That basically has had and historically derailed a few of our partnerships until we kind of investigate, well, why is that an issue? Well, what's the thing that needs to change or what's the actual level of investment required to adjust that as opposed to like, oh, there is this, you know, this box that is unknown that has a lot of compliance around it. And like, you know what, we're not going to touch that. And so I just encourage bringing that mentality um, to, you know, always ask why, always feel like you need to understand something. And if you're not, if it's not clicking, then I would ask why again and ask why again. That's awesome. I love that. Um, but a, another version of the Administrative Procedure Act that rather than the what process, why did you, you know, it has you have to demonstrate the why. It's a great one. Um, before I ask Aaron the same question, um, we do have 10 minutes left. My understanding is nobody has asked any questions in the chat, which seems uh, deeply implausible. Uh, so be, d don't don't be shy. I want to encourage people to, to drop some questions in the chat and we have some time to, to cover them. So um, Aaron, if you were put in charge tomorrow, uh, the uh, the strictures were released. What is the what's the thing that you would uh, have the, the FHFA in particular, or maybe any other regulatory agency do? Yeah, it's it's a flavor of what Misha said, which you know goes to and actually this is a great step in doing that, which is sort of bringing together and making the communication much more direct with people who and companies who are out trying to provide perhaps new services, changes to services, things like that. I think when I rewind to the, my banking days, and I remember trying to translate between our regulators and the financial or, or the fintechs that we were working with, it, it, I think it would have been a lot easier. And we did this in many circumstances, actually, of bringing folks together and letting folks like FHFA ask directly of the service providers, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? That also, though, brings a sense of responsibility to the providers. So this is a highly re regulated space for a reason, right? It's uh, mistakes are costly um, in a quantitative basis, on a qualitative basis, and context really matters. So I think if you're going to be a provider in this space, really understanding on that sense the why. Why are these rules in place? What are they trying to accomplish? Who's trying to be protected and in what you know capacity helps the providers answer the questions to FHA, FHA, excuse me, to FHFA and other regulators a little bit more directly. But having that real direct communication, I think, can very, very um, materially clear up misunderstandings and education on both sides. Because I think that's also where things get lost is just maybe not understanding on one side or the other exactly what is trying to be accomplished. Yeah, I, I think that's um, I think that's great. I mean. One thing that I would do, I'll ask my, I'll answer my own question, is um, I think that a lot of the innovation questions end up getting stalled, largely for the reasons that you guys have just um, discussed, which is it's a little complicated. There's one more person I need to ask. I'm not sure. I kind of want to say yes, but I don't have the authority to say yes. Or I haven't. And I think that, um, you know, if I were in charge of a regulatory agency that was trying to pursue an innovation agenda, the one thing I would do is put pressure on decisions um, because the companies that are making these decisions know is an okay answer as long as it's clear or, a, you know, not now. And that's almost always that, you know, no is never final. So the not now, we can't do this yet. And what you've seen, whether it's the CFPB's Catalyst pro program or others, is that things languished um, and, and people didn't have certainty whether they should keep trying or move on. And I think, um, you know, if I were in the, uh, if I were in this seat, I would put a lot of pressure on the, the decision-making body to just come to either a yes, yes with constraints or a not now. And I think um, getting that within, let's say, a 90-day or a six-month period instead of a nine-month or 18-month period um, really makes a difference uh, for the ability of an agency to interact with the innovation community. Okay, we've got a question, which is great. Um, so uh, the, there's a question from the audience around Latino community is inclined to use more cash for transactions. But unfortunately, it's a little bit of a question for Asusu, so we're not here. Um, but, uh, you know, for both for you, Misha and, uh, Aaron, how do you think about, uh, 
transaction records, cash flow records, when a lot of the transactions that the you know transaction by transactions are actually not visible, they're ATM transactions instead of swipe card transactions. Does that cause challenges for your models or can you handle that risk as well? I think there are certainly some granularity aspects that may be obfuscated by the fact that you're just seeing cash coming in and out. But I think what we've seen is you still have some trends. You have trends of um, balances, you have trends of uh, behavior, and you can sort of see, you know, in one example, um, a consumer who is steadily increasing his or her bank account um, or depository account balance, whether it's by be a check or another method, looks a little bit different from someone who is very, very close to a zero dollars and then a spike up and a spike down. Those are two fundamentally different pictures of cash flow. So you do lose a little bit of the um, of the exactly what's happening, but you can still see um, to a decent extent what the cash flow of the consumer looks like. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. Maybe to, to build on like the how we think about this, um, we think about the you know Latinx community really in two buckets. There's those who have arrived recently, so came to the U.S. in the last call it three years, and those who've been here for you know most of their lives or you know longer longer than that. And similar to how you know you have to think about it on a sub segment uh, level, the uh, the right data solution is actually different whether it's someone who's just gotten here or someone who's been here for a long time. If someone who's just gotten here, they don't yet really have bank data. They don't have rental data to use, right? So that's an opportunity where we we will pull in data from, you know, from Mexico, from the DR, from other parts of Central America, and be able to allow folks to, you know, start from something uh, rather than have to start fully over. And then those that do have a bank account, you know, we also will support them with cash flow based underwriting, verifying their income. I think the nuances that that Aaron has brought into our non-cash transactions are are real, but some of the, the core trends around someone's financial health can still be observed uh, based on you know the uh, the trends in the core bank balance. Another question um, from the audience is sort of zooming out from home ownership to the broader questions around sustaining financial resilience. And certainly in the history of this country, we've seen some periods where home ownership actually act as, a, as as an anchor or as a downward drag on on financial resilience, um, even while in the broader picture, it's been a leg up and a path towards, you know, greater financial resources. Um, how do you guys think about the interplay between home ownership as a proxy and the broader sort of mandate or mission for um, building sustainable financial resilience among uh, lower income or immigrant population? That's a hard question. Um... I agree. I mean, uh, you know, I won't. I don't think I'll. I'll share much that this this audience hasn't already been thinking about. But like, owning a piece of property here is like the achievement of the American dream, right? It's like you've you've made it. You've like you've established yourself here, and all the blood, sweat, and tears, the sacrifice, the humility that comes from moving to a new country and you know starting over. Uh, and you know, learning a new language and having to retrain yourself or find your way into the financial system, like the 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 turning point in feeling secure comes from home ownership, and so it's an ab absolutely a critical component of you know certainly the immigrant financial life, but any American's financial life is feeling in independent and having a, a place to call your own, and so it's it's a it's an incredibly important component, but given that it is the largest purchase of your life, it makes sense that it has, um, you know, the most stringent of uh, verification requirements, data requirements, um, processes, and there's just so much room and need for continued innovation. And then just, again, would, would encourage everyone to ask why and, um, and you know, be, be, be creative and um, find opportunities to learn from folks who figured these problems out before, and that'll just continue to help drive innovation in the U.S. system. Aaron, final uh, final thoughts before we let you guys go? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. Whether you're new here or you've lived here for your entire life, um, buying a home is really meaningful. And I think that makes solving the problems around it all the more important. And I think if you look back 
in the history of the U.S. and many times in which homeownership was uh, the anchor or sort of pulling someone down, if you will, it was a result of some of the problems we're here trying to solve. You know, Misha, me, Wimimo, like trying to price things more correctly, trying to have better uh, experiences, better structured loans. Those, you know, the outcome of things that didn't work well there were big contributors to why owning a home could actually be a negative experience. And so I think anyone who's thinking about getting into this space, it's incredibly worthwhile, incredibly important, incredibly difficult for a good reason. Um, but it feels like events like this and partnerships of, of bringing folks together is a, a, a sort of positive sign for the future. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. And thanks, especially to Aaron and Misha and Mimo. This was a great panel and we really appreciate your contributions. Awesome. Thank you. See you later.